question I want to uh, address today or talk to you about today is um, you know, what it takes, uh, what's necessary to make progress in an environment that's you know, increasingly chaotic and complex and moving really quickly. And we define progress, you, know, you say I'm going from, um, you know, from C linearly from A to B to C, maybe I'm looking for my you know, round A of funding or I need to get to my you know, minimally viable product. But we see progress a little bit more dynamic and uh, there's no really you know, clear path forward. So with that, we actually see companies doing four things, uh, four things to keep their forward momentum. And I'll talk about them a little bit uh, today. Uh, this was the, uh, yeah. So the four things are, uh, how do you free up your problem solvers to innovate, right? How do you free up your problem solvers so they can deeply get, uh, you know, a better understanding of the problem statement? How do they can frame the problem better? Uh, the second is, uh, command and control structures are, you know, they're outdated. Uh, you know, going up the chain of command to make a decision, you know, slows things down. So there's, you know, there's certainly a big theme in the builder model for decentralization. And then the, th the third area is, you know, AI is certainly going to have an indelible mark on society, but we, s we see a lot of discussions today around how do you meaningfully apply AI, and that includes, you know, res you know, the leadership in this, you know, in this hallway, in this room, uh, being cognizant of the unintended consequences. And again, uh, you know, I won't talk about the promise of AI, but just touch upon the, you know, the need to be mindful about it. And then lastly, this idea of being biased for action. And most startups are, you know, they're very action-oriented, high-velocity decision-making. That's pretty easy to do, but uh, there's, there's some, some interesting insights on in how you can innovate constantly when your windows of opportunities are shrinking. And so we'll talk about a little bit this idea called bias for action, which we've heard a lot uh, in the last couple of years. So this is a video of, uh, of a, a prototype that we built for a major telco out of Europe. And actually, during this exercise, you know, we, we, we learned a lot around these four principles. Just to talk about this for a second, when the cars are pink, they're driving closer to one another. And when the cars are blue, uh, they, uh, they, they uh, create a, a, l a longer distance. And the reason for that is uh, they're using a low latency platform you know, to bring the cars together. But the point of this is, is not the technology. Uh, this major telco, about 18 months, was again at this uh, impasse. They, they didn't know how to push forward. They, did, they, they, they were slowing down. Uh, imagine they're at the top of a mountain and you know, they, they came to the top with their business plan, but you know, how do you keep the forward momentum uh, moving? And by really focusing on the problem solver, you know, by uh, re engineering not only the product, but also the organization, uh, in fact, they ended up launching a startup in Silicon Valley just this year around this concept. Uh, so the first idea, you know, success is built on uh, ideas, ideas that are pioneered by people. And uh, but we strongly believe that if you want to innovate on products, if you want to innovate on products, you have to innovate uh, how you build those products. And that's a great example is the Airbnb. Uh, you know, they produce some 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 great product. Uh, their design team put together a um, a tool called Sketch to Code, and it takes ideas from the mind of the designer and quickly moves them into the engineering realm. As everybody knows, there's a big cultural gap between design teams and engineering teams. And if you can do things like that, bring those teams together, you can accelerate the, you know, the idea to launch phase. Uh, so this, this, this design uh, uh, alternatives is also exemplified by a program that Airbnb did about 2016 where they used algorithms to generate design alternatives for this cabin partition between uh, in, in the airline, right, between the crew and the passengers. And the design turned out to be very bionic. So you see on the first image, it turned out to look very organic. Designers wouldn't have produced this if it wasn't for an algorithm. Uh, so just this idea of thinking very differently and being open-minded about how you solve problems is, is, I think, fundamental to moving things forward. Uh, the, second, you know, the second area that uh, I just want to touch upon is this builder model. Uh, for anybody who's building a product today, it's, it's certainly not monolithic. Uh, it's probably using uh, technologies like microservices and containers. Simply, the idea of smaller units of building uh, is a paradigm that's accelerating. Uh, it's moving forward very quickly, and it really is sort of ties to this idea of forward progression and staying current. Uh, the example I like to use is uh, this. You know, we, I stumbled across it a couple of weeks ago. We do some work for Porsche on their connected apps, but I didn't know that they worked with a startup out of Berlin uh, to take the keyless entry from, uh, I think it was six seconds to two seconds. And the way they did that was 
they eliminated proxies, right? They eliminated any intermediaries as part of the workflow. Uh, they did use a distributed ledger underneath that, and they created new value, a new experience, right? They choreographed a new technology for a, for a better customer experience. Walmart and, um, and IBM are, are, are reducing the time it takes to spot food contamination from seven days to two seconds. And this is all possible because you're breaking up the application into bits and pieces, creating transparency. Uh, the picture on the right-hand side, given that we're in a telco event here, is, uh, is a micro data center that's in a tower. You know, maybe not going to be in every tower, but certainly this idea of distributing storage and compute to closer to the point of consumption fits in with this idea of decentralization. So distributed apps are going to be a big part of you know, keeping that forward momentum. You know, a blockchain you know, a fundamental to distributed apps is a nice startup uh, out here in the hallways called Settlement that uh, has an SDK for smart contracts. But if you have a mental block on, on blockchain, you know, it's, it's actually all you have to do is sit down and kind of figure out how do I inter inject transparency into my workflow? How do I remove unnecessary middlemen? And th these are just six ways that we've found just on a smartphone that's in your pocket to create value. One of them is just in the app certification process. You can, you know, you can reward participants for accelerating that process. So those are three ways. Uh, you only got two more. So uh, the third has to be about AI, right? AI is synonymous with progress. It's going to leave an indelible mark on society. And um, I don't think anybody uh, is under-imagining uh, the, uh, the promise of AI. I think what's happening is we're under-imagining uh, the consequences. And I'm not, I'm not talking about the Elon Musk, right, the robots will kill us. I think I'm just talking about the responsibility that leaders in this room and outside in the hallways have in order to think through you know, the ethics behind it. Uh, just the data alone, if it's, if it's imbalanced, if you're collecting imbalanced data, the results are going to be skewed. Um, whether you have gender identity, you, know, you, can, you, you can do a big disservice to vulnerable populations, to people that deserve better, whether you're doing you know, credit scoring or whatnot. So I think the idea is to have a human strategy as part of your AI system. Uh, simple things like an, an algorithm council. You know, you know, if, if you're a large company, you can do something like this. If you're a smaller company, maybe you know, leadership needs to hire and train talent on ethics. Right? Uh, as a computer scientist, I never took any ethics classes when I was younger. I took it as part of my corporate life. But when you're dealing with data that can have severe consequences, you know, and unintended consequences, you have to take a look at that. Uh, so you know, looking at the human element, uh, the math, you know, mathematics and statistics won't solve all our problems. That's, that's part one. I think part two is, you know, as you learn more about this technology, you realize that it's actually not hardened yet. So some of these deep learning frameworks uh, and the computational graphs that are inside them can be fooled, right? Uh, if you understand their inner workings, there's, there's, there's a lot of research around how computer vision algorithms can be fooled simply by doing some you know, graffiti you know, on, the, uh, you know, on the image itself. So hardening the algorithms, understanding the technical limitations is, 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 uh, is sort of the two parts of this yin and yang. Yeah, at the end of the day, AI is neither good or bad. It's going to be leadership trying to figure out uh, how to uh, solve for the unintended consequences. I think the last, uh, you know, the last trend here in, is around uh, uh, being action-oriented. And uh, uh, again, startups are really action-oriented in that as a flat organization, decisions are made really quickly. So it's, it's easy to think that uh, they got, they've got it solved. But their windows of opportunity are also shrinking pretty rapidly. Uh, this image in the background is of a startup that we worked with a couple of years ago. They produced this smart display that goes into cities. And, uh, you know, what they did was they did two things to bias themselves for action. Uh, the first thing was they, you know, they sought uh, practicality, not perfection in their design. Uh, and then th in that way, they, uh, their design thinking was not, you know, I want to design for scale. I just want to design for my, se my next round of funding. Or I want to design you know, for you know, that relationship that I'm going to pursue with. In this case, it was Verizon that purchased them. So, you know, this idea of venture design, designing for practicality and for the product outcome was really important for them. And the second was activating the organization. You know, again, we, we design products, we engineer the products, but sometimes we forget that we have to uh, design for the organization itself and how it's going to look like. In the telco example, you know, they launched a startup and that was the way they engineered or designed for the organization. In this case, they basically granted and defended freedom for their employees to participate in the actual design of this uh, of this particular product itself. 
so that, uh, you know, again, if you're, you know, if you're wondering whether you're making forward progression, if it's sufficient, if it's moving uh, neatly, there's a, there's a great quote uh, by Jeff Bezos from his 2017 sh uh, letter to the shareholders. He said, listen, you know, processes matter, this is paraphrasing, but you have to ask yourself the question, you know, do you own the process or the, does the process own you? And uh, yeah, I think that, that, that sort of answers you know, whether you're moving forward. You know, we recently got acquired by Ultron. Uh, we were 11,000 employees, now we're about 44,000. And I, I think this is gonna be an important question for me as well is you know, how to continue to make high velocity decisions, how to empower my people, uh, the teams, and how to, uh, how, to, how to participate in some of these new trends like decentralization. So with that, anyway, thank, thanks a lot for your attention and hanging around and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks.